So how are things? Otherwise, everything settling down. Yeah, otherwise, things are settling down. I think it's the new normal that we're kind of getting used to. Mm-hmm. It's um, obviously tough times for everyone. Um, you know, so across the board, I think consumption is taking a big hit. Um, there's a lot of, you know, no clarity about how things are going to evolve mm-hmm. you know, post this lockdown. So we all kind of have our fingers crossed and hoping that things will work out. So. But on the food and all, it must not have affected much because. Uh, uh, no, no, it's affected massively. Oh, the demand and all must be very good. Not at all. Not at all. So, uh, you got to understand that uh, basically, if you look at across the board food, it's uh, divided into two categories. One is impulsive, and the other is compulsive. Mm-hmm. So, food that you need to have every single day, which is like your fruits, vegetables, milk, and then you have your impulsive, like your ice cream, confectioneries, uh, biscuits. Mm-hmm. Uh, chocolates. So on the entire impulsive, we have seen like a slowdown of almost about 70-75 percent of the sales. 70 uh, to 75 percent. Yeah. So oh, that's massive. Uh, also, what happens is that when you're not actually on the road, mm-hmm. the alcohol consumption actually is not there. So you have a lot of people uh, who would have been, let's take a new market, and would have picked up a coke or a fruity or a Pepsi or something and had a drink. But mm-hmm. the new market is shut. You know that or, or that event of the person consuming a beverage has gone on. Oh. Uh, then you look at the compulsive products, which are like your say milk, fruits, and vegetables. Uh, it has been hit by a lot of supply chain issues. Um, so trucks not coming in, fruits and vegetables not being transported, markets being open only for a very short time. And then, especially when you look at something like milk, which I do, uh, mm. demand has gone down by thirty-five percent because all your hotels, restaurant caterers. Uh, tea shops, they all shut. Mm-hmm. They would actually end up contributing 30-35% of the entire sales. Oh, I see. So, but, you know, honestly, uh, I, I can't really complain because there are other sectors which there's zero revenue. We are at least getting some revenue. Mm-hmm. So, but milk, the demand must be good on the milk side? No, it's down by 30%. Oh, milk is also down by 30%. I see. Milk is also down by 30%. I thought people were in the house, so therefore, for uh, being more healthy, <laughs> they would be having more of milk and all the healthy products instead of having all the unhealthy products. It's actually a vicious cycle. If you think about it, the, mm. in your own office, the amount of milk that you consume when people come to have a cup of tea with you, yeah, consumption has gone down, right? Mm. So you can't have more than two glasses of milk a day, mm. you know, as milk or tea at home. Generally, the consumption of tea, coffee, and everything happens because you're socializing. Yeah. So, uh, and weddings and marriages and conferences. And, you know, so there's a huge slump in demand, which we hope that it will come back up. But then it's something which has to be seen how and when we come out of this. And what about real estate and all? How's the real estate? That must have been got. Uh... Must have severely affected. <laughs> we're not even we're not even actually uh, looking at that division of ours. You know, we've not even bothered <laughs> a single day to have a single call on what's going to happen in real estate. I think it's all um, difficult to say. But as if I was to quote Anuj Puri, and I think he has a very good hold of the way that the markets are. I think uh, both Anuj Puri and Deepak Parikh both said this: is that you're looking at a very a large re-rating of the real estate sector. So you'll have a large amount of uh, deflation of prices. Uh, you know, there will be some reduction in the raw material cost. Like, but I think we'll figure out what's going to happen and how things going to happen post September. I think right now we are uh, living in a dark matter zone where we don't know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> Hence the topic of post COVID business continuity planning. Yeah. yeah. So has Hush joined or? No, not yet. Uh, Shuman or Nilanjana, uh, Nilanjan, can you check with Hush Mayer if he's joining in? Sir, uh, he has not joined yet. Okay, let me call him. He has just joined, sir. He has, he has just, just, just joined. joined. Just in time. Good morning, Bhaiya. 
I, I have, I'm getting envious of your beard as we grow. Mm -hmm. Mine refuses to grow beyond a certain point. <laughs> it's not. It's not one of those things which really matter much if they grow or don't. <laughs> what matters is 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 getting depleted by the day. <laughs> okay, so should we? Uh, we'll just start uh, the way that the format uh, I thought we will do today's webinar is uh, I'll just set the context by speaking for a few minutes, uh, post which uh, we would go to Mr. Eamon Kanoria and post with a, a few opening remarks by uh, Harsh Bhaiya. Uh, once this is done, we will start taking Q&A from the audiences. So if any person in the audience has any questions, please do type it out in the chat box uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will uh, take those questions up during the Q&A session. So, welcome to the ICC webinar on business continuity planning. Uh, one of the definitions of a crisis is a stage in a sequence of events which the trend of all future events, especially for better or for worse, is determined. A turning point. In a crisis, every action and decision we take and make shapes our future. Our leaders, business owners, entrepreneurs and professionals are in the midst of two major crises currently, the COVID-19 and its subsequent economic impact, and how we deal with them will decide our fate. The constantly evolving COVID-19 pandemic has cast a long shadow on the global economy, which was already jolted by the US-China trade war. The global shock comes at a particularly inopportune time for India, as the economy was already on a very concerning downward trajectory since the turn of FY1819. The immediate economic and market impacts of the coronavirus is visible, with the rupee hitting a new low vis-a-vis -vis the dollar in March due to a global risk of sentiment. The global and local supply chain has been disrupted. Imports and exports are down. The markets are bearish. The MSME segment has perhaps been the hardest hit. MSMEs are grappling with problems like low liquidity or cash flow, the lack of workforce, as daily wages are relocating to the villages. Manufacturing and export businesses will also take a hit as the situation remains uncertain. The service sector is also slowing down with more people opting for social distance. As per the estimates, India is close to 69 million MSMEs with micro enterprises accounting for the majority presence in the country. The virus pandemic has clearly rattled the sector and operates on limited cash resources and huge fixed costs, which make their ability to withstand such shocks extremely difficult. Across the various domains of auto, apparel, F&B, agriculture, the story remains uncannily the same for such enterprises. With a plethora of industries shifted their work practices to work from home during the lockdown, it has not been simple for MSMEs who, for whom such concept stands redundant and unheard of. The government has started taking some steps to keep MSME segment afloat. The Reserve Bank of India recently introduced long-term repo operations worth to be 100,000 crores to help banks <coughs> increasing lending at cheaper interest rates. While these measures give some hope to the MSME sector, a lot is still required to shore up the economy going forward. As a Nobel Prize winning philosopher, Albert Camus once said, in the depth of winter, I finally learned that there was in me an invincible summer. We humans are resilient species. We are adaptable by nature. We are resourcefulness inside us that says no problem is permanent and nothing that happens is pervasive. Post COVID-19 pandemic, India will have the opportunity to build an economy that is more resilient, diversified and attractive to the global manufacturers and services as a majority of the businesses worldwide have faced disruptions and economic fallout. Our Honorable Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, in his post mentioned that India as a youthful nation, known for its innovation zeal, can take the lead in providing a new work culture. Prime Minister Modi has envisioned the new businesses and work culture being redefined on the following vowels. Adaptability, A. Efficiency, E. Inclusivity, I. Opportunity, O. Universalism, U. We Indians have the ability and we will leapfrog past our competitors and take our economy to the next level. I thank you all on behalf of ICC for being a part of this webinar 
to share your valuable thoughts and suggestions. Now, could I request Shri Heman Kanuria to kindly share with his, his opening remarks and thoughts? Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, good morning, everyone. And it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. Today on the webinar, this is a new way that we would be having our lives running now, where we may not be meeting for a long time, and it will be all through webinar. I think that last six weeks has taught us something which is very, very different, and how to live a life on only a technology platform, lockdown in our houses. I think the disruption is a part of our lives, but this disruption was something which we had never expected that with COVID-19, the whole world is locked out. This is the first time in the history of mankind where we have close to about one-fifth of the entire world population of more than 7 billion who are locked, locked down and locked up in their houses and they cannot come out. Definitely, it has affected the businesses. Our lives have got affected. So all of us, we are going through our personal... I, personal uh, reinvention, where we are trying to invent ourselves, being in our houses, with our families, with our friends, with, uh, with our relatives, if we are staying in a joint family. So it is very different that we are getting acclimatized to a different kind of a life on a personal basis. But I think that first couple of weeks, it must have taken us to acclimatize to that life and then gradually look at that what is going to be happening to our businesses. Many of us initially, got very worried that what will happen to the businesses because there is a total disruption in the way that our businesses will be run and how we have been running our businesses. But gradually over a period of time, I think one good thing out of this lockdown, which has been for a longer tenure, that it has made us think, first get scared on the personal side, then scared about the business and gradually settle down and find out solutions to all the problems. So many times when you are locked down for a longer period of time, it is also good in a way because it helps you to rethink everything. Disruption was a part of business, but as we never expected this kind of a disruption, so we need to really go back to the drawing boards and rethink about our business. We have to rethink about our strategies. We have to rethink that what exactly is the product or the services that we are offering and whether it would be relevant post COVID or not. So that's the first question that we need to ask. So basically all the businesses have to go back to their basics, ask the basic questions about the customer, that who our customer is and what kind of product or services are we providing to them, how we can provide them in a more efficient manner. We will have to use technology to a much larger extent. People like us who are coming from you know, decades back. So we were not used to the technology to the extent that we have got used to now in the last six weeks. And I think that this is a new normal for all of us. And in business also, this will become a new normal that we use, we have to use technology more extensively, not only in the communication that we are doing, but also in the businesses. If we are manufacturing certain products, if we are providing certain services, Whichever businesses that we are in, we have to ask the question that to what extent can we include the technology? We were all used to being in our offices, having people coming to our offices and working along with them, face to face, meeting people. So all that will take a longer time to come back. But whether it is good or bad, I think that from every disruption, there are good things which can emerge. And this also, I think from this disruption, there will be a lot of new learning lessons for us. One is the way that we were living our lives and the way that we had got used to all the luxuries of life. I think sitting in our houses, locked down, we have started going back to simple things. And that would be the new norm for the industry and for businesses, to be simple and to be frugal. So we need to get into the frugality mode instead of the luxurious mode that we were in. So therefore, whether we are conducting our businesses, even with the employees, you know, we have, fortunately, we have large number of employees in different industries and we have been having extensive discussions with them. And everyone locked down in their houses, they've started feeling that whether the cost which they were incurring in, their, in having a lifestyle, which was luxurious, is it required or not? 
So therefore, many of them have come forward and said that the compensation which we are getting, voluntary, that the compensation which we are getting now, when we look at the requirement that we have, in proportion to that, it was high. So therefore, we can look at living this, living a life, having savings, but at the same time, can save costs on our lifestyle also. So I think that this is one area which is going to be helpful for all of us when we are getting back into businesses. Definitely, this disruption is something which we had not wished for, but because it has happened, we have to now turn this adversity into an opportunity. And the opportunity from the perspective of uh, being more nimble in our activities, more relevant to the customers, more relevant if you are providing services to the customer and also to the products. Because the de demand pattern is going to change. I think that one industry which is going to get tremendously affected would be all the luxurious products and the lifestyle products. Because people will start asking these questions to themselves that whether they need those particular products or not. So people being in that business need to look at their manufacturing plants and see that where they, whether they can reorient their products into something which is more relevant in the po post-COVID world. There are a lot of opportunities for Indian businesses. Then at present, let me first of all address, it, address the challenges which the Indian businesses are facing and will face. Unfortunately for us, the governments, fortunately and unfortunately both, because they are both sides of it. Fortunately, the government's attention has gone more into the health and food, providing food and safety to people, health, safety and food. And that was the most important and critical factor at this particular juncture. And that is what the government has focused on. The economy at this juncture has taken a back foot. And Many of the countries which we have seen that whether it be a US, whether it be Germany, Japan, and many of the other countries have also come out with many economic packages for the industry. So the industry post COVID will be in a position to sustain themselves, survive, and also grow to a certain extent because growth is going to be effective. So, but they are able to at least survive and stabilize for India. And I think that for Indian businesses, the reality is that we'll have to all fend for ourselves because I do not see that there will be huge stimulus packages which will be coming out of the government. There may be something in trickles here and there which will be coming in because as we have seen that RBI also about four weeks back announced the moratorium and this moratorium is only very temporary because it will help that for the next 90 days people will not face the problems. But after that what happens? So I think that uh, the Indian industry will have to get used to fending for themselves and finding out solutions that in this problematic times, how they can be more innovative and how they can look at their costs and revisit their entire product and the supply chain, which they're having, because the supply chain is also definitely getting effective. So I think that this is one reality and the faster that we embrace that and not keep on expecting the, the SOPs coming from the government or subsidies or support, I think that we would be more realistic. If something comes from the government, it is very good. It should be treated as a bonanza, but we should get prepared and to get prepared to fend for ourselves. Another advantage would be that because we have got used to technology, so we would be in a position to also reduce our cost. So work from home, the concept which is there, I think that we have to now also look at work from anywhere. That a person may be sitting in his garden, can he be working? Or sitting anywhere in the roadside or in the office or in the home. So because technology would facilitate us to do that, especially people who are in the service business, people who are involved in manufacturing, it may not be possible to do, to do the manufacturing sitting at your homes there you have to have physical workers you have to have employees you have to because you have to have the machines where you are operating on or it be in agriculture so people will get people will be there physically present but many of the work can be looked at from working from anywhere on the technology platform so i think that this is another area which all of us in business will have to look at
just let me share my experiences in the various businesses that we are having and what we are going through from the perspective of business continuity. For the business continuity, because at this juncture, many of our business, and we are in the primarily our main businesses in equipment financing to construction, mining, healthcare equipments, and also to infrastructure projects, all that has just got stalled because there's nothing moving there. So our, our customers are facing problems. They have problems which they will also face for the next few months because many of them have migrant workers. So many of them are migrant workers have gone back home. Many of the migrant workers are locked down. And as soon as everything opens up, the first thing which they will do is go back to their homes. And then whether they come back or not, there's a question mark. So there will be a huge disruption and we are already interacting with all our clients to get them understand and appreciate that this disruption is going to happen. So how they are going to prepare for this disruption from the perspective of their business continuity. So the business continuity, the biggest success in the mantra would be survival at this juncture and for survival to reduce costs, to become frugal, to become more efficient wherever it is required. Some of the businesses may not be relevant because in the post COVID world, maybe that there are some businesses that we are doing will be irrelevant. So therefore we need to see that how do we do a systematic close down of those particular businesses? Because in business, if we get too emotional, then there's a problem. So we have to detach ourselves, look at the business in a realistic manner, in a practical way. Some would work and some areas it will not work. So wherever it is not working, we have to cut down and close down those particular businesses. So like we have, we are also in the infrastructure, we have power, roads, ports. So all these businesses where we are involved, we are seeing a huge disruption happening. Some of the businesses we are just waiting because post COVID, we do not know that what would be the pattern of consumption? What would be the pattern of demand? There can be only some homework that we can do and some expectations that we have. But when everything opens up, those may be totally belied. It those, those expectations may not happen. So we need to again have a plan B. So I think that at this juncture, each business for that is what my experience is. And I'm sharing with every one of you that basically each business should have a plan A, plan B and plan C. The plan A is that if everything happens and we come back to normalcy in the next 30 days to 60 days, then life is good. You can take plan B that if it doesn't happen, if the disruption continues for a longer period of time, then how do we cut down our businesses? The third plan has to be that if the entire demand shrinkage takes place in our business and it takes place in a very big way, then what do we do? And while we are taking all these particular, while we are making all these plans, we need to keep into account that if the government support comes in, very good. If the government doesn't support, doesn't come in, then what do we do? Because, you know, the interaction which I'm having with the government, with RBI and with the various people, I see that they have the will, they have the intent, but at this juncture, they do not have a plan. And that will take some time because they are also waiting and uh, you know, I will not blame them because for them, the urgency is to ensure the health, safety and food for people. So therefore that is where their, uh, their uh, entire uh, attention has gone into at this juncture. So these are my, some of my uh, views and I would just, I shared my thoughts with you. I think you've raised a lot yeah. of very interesting points that I would want to circle back to uh, uh, after Hashmeya has made his opening remarks. Uh, some very worrying for the future and some quite uh, interesting uh, for the coming times. So now if I could uh, request Hush Bhaiya to uh, give his views on the current and the post-COVID period, and then we can get into Q&A. There's al already a lot of questions that people have been putting into the Q&A and the chat box. Uh, request if you want to ask a question live, if you can raise your hands um, on the uh, attendees column, so we can also take some questions live from college. Hush Bhaiya, over to you. Thanks, Mayank. Uh, hi, Hemant. Hi. Uh, and uh, dear friends, well, uh, I think my friend Hemant has covered a very vast ground. So what I think uh, I will just sum up my presentation. 
focusing on a couple of points. Uh, I think today everyone is gripped with this issue of lockdown. When will the lockdown get lifted? Now, there are two aspects of it. One, of course, is when is it safe to open the lockdown? And the other aspect is how this lockdown impacts the economy and more importantly, the psychological well-being of the people. So on the medical side, I'm, I'm hardly competent to take a view, but the general sense is that it is uh, good that we had the lockdown early. It's good to keep some level of lockdown because um, otherwise uh, this could spread very fast and cause more uh, health-wise more harm to the people. It is without a doubt that this has a debilitating blow on the economy, which is a no-brainer. And therefore, the earlier we open, there is a certain uh, possibility of the economy trudging back. But on the third aspect, which is psychological, you see, there are many, many Indians, far more than those of us on this webinar, uh, who really live in very, very difficult circumstances. They live five people to a room, and that's really the vast majority of urban India. And for them to be in lockdown, uh, actually, there is no social distancing that is practically possible in the lifestyle that they have uh, because of their income situation. And also, the psychology of five people having to spend one month together, you can understand if five of us in our families were to stay in one room together for 30 days, you could, I don't think we need to discuss much as to what it could possibly do to our own psychology. So there is a psychological need for people to go out. And then there is a physical need for the people who are daily wage earners and people who have small shops and hawkers, etc., who want to get out there and earn their livelihood. So this is really about the fear. But I want to link fear to economy. And what I wanted to say is that even if we theoretically open up the economy whenever we do, the problem of the economy will not be solved till the fear of this pandemic is removed. And what is the fear about? First of all, it's fear that we'll get uh, infected and we'll be sick and there will be a problem. Now, how do we get out of the fear? One, of course, is that you have a credible medicine, which for the best estimates is six months away. The second, which is more permanent, is that you have a vaccine, which with best estimates is 12 months away. And the third is that the government comes to a conclusion that this infection rate is not very high. There's a certain amount of herd immunity that has got developed. It is not that fatal or risky as it probably sounded earlier, or the doctors have figured out how to handle it. And they say, okay, the fear should not be there. Unless either of these three things happen, the fear will not go. Now, how it is related to the economy? 10 to 15% of our countrymen actually consume almost 50% of our total, or at least take decisions to consume 50% of our GDP production. Now, it's these 10 to 15% person, percent people who have the option to avoid taking those decisions of non-essential nature when they are faced with this situation. Why? One, because they have lost money, they've lost business, they've lost jobs. And two, because they don't want to step out to consume the various services because of the fear of getting infected. So if these people don't actually go out to spend, even if you open up the production lines or construction sites, how will you keep funding it? It's the typical situation of an electric generating station. You can't store very little of the electricity. You, if you generate it, somebody has to consume it. I mean, recently, you would know that many power plants had to be shut down because the consumption of electricity fell. Similarly, the production lines or even construction projects ultimately will flow and be possible only if there's a cash flow. And this cash flow has to be created by a demand. And if this demand is not created because of fear, then somehow or the other, even if you start the economy, it will come to a sputtering stop because uh, the money will have dried up. So 
key solution to getting the economy back on track to my mind is addressing this fear issue in with one of the three solutions and until then we have to be we have to brace ourselves for a very very stop and start kind of a situation where the economy will of course operate because there are certain essential requirements which people will still consume food and other products maybe some other essential items but discretionary spend i think will be an historic low and hardly at all because people's psychological mindset will be to save rather than to spend now what is the solution as far as the economy is concerned one of course is getting the fears the second is we have to create liquidity on the demand side how do you do it well either by giving money to them and insisting that they spend it in a very short period of time or create incentives by which they need to spend a certain amount of money uh, by getting some tax break or something else by which people go out and spend to keep the cycle going so this is a very very important part of getting the economy back on track the other is that much like if your car falls into a ditch it is very difficult for the car with its own engine and its own horsepower and even a skilled driver to pull itself out of it but if there is an external push given by a couple of people then you can pull the car out of the ditch and assuming that it has not been damaged much the car can go on its journey without a problem now this push this critical push of that to pull the car out of the ditch is really what we need from the government Uh, Hemant did mention that this is uh, probably an issue on which government is mulling and it might come out with something maybe not adequate or whatever but it is i believe a very very critical requirement and i agree with Hemant that at this moment they are focusing on food delivery and uh, uh, managing the medical side of it but sooner or later this push will be essential otherwise this car will remain stuck in the ditch because no matter which company it is i mean except for of course very very few uh, will have the ability on its own to get itself out and go on a journey there's nothing wrong with the car there's nothing it's just fallen in this ditch this uh, pandemic ditch and it needs some external uh, energy some external support to pull itself out of this ditch now <clears throat> coming to very briefly what should we do i mean as different companies hemant mentioned about his sectors uh, we are basically in three sectors healthcare reality and hospitality let me talk to you very briefly one one minute about each healthcare funnily enough and i think most of you will be amused to know this that while we have a pandemic there will be a gen- there was a general perception that the healthcare would be fine and flourishing but interestingly our hospitals are at 50% occupancy of what they were last year at the same time the, uh, this year even in this situation and simply because everyone who had an elective surgery that could be postponed both doctors and patients have decided to postpone it of course this cannot be postponed indefinitely so there will be a bunching up at some point of time but if they could postpone it for a month or two that's what they have decided to do so actually the occupancies in hospitals have fallen dramatically except for things like child birth which uh, probably was not no option but uh, to go through with it uh, on other things there has been a very very low footfall and also uh, opds have come down and so has um, uh, anything else which people could postpone only the thing that is happening is if there are emergencies of any nature which also interestingly during this period has been down significantly now take reality in reality we will have a major challenge for two reasons one of course is that the worker issue will be big the reason is the workers would have gone back or if they are stuck here as soon as the lockdown uh, opens up they will like to rush back to their families in their villages and if we are going to have a tough time getting enough workers but i think that can still be managed with some because in this part of india 
uh, there are still availability of worker is not such a big challenge. But the bigger problem will be the cash flow. People who have bought apartments probably will have some difficulties in making installment payments. They will ask for time, etc. And of course, every organization sells apartments every month and uh, has a cash flow coming out of that. That will obviously get impacted at least for the next six to nine months. So clearly the inflow will be low and therefore construction velocity, I think, will come down. Coming to hospitality, this is really going to suffer big time. We know that the airlines are shut. The airlines are shut. Most people who come and stay in hotels fly into the city. Very uh, little traffic is going to be there. Hotels will by and large be empty. Restaurants will be hit because people will tend to avoid going there and social distancing and all these other norms. So hospitality is in for a very, very long summer. Uh, long winter, sorry, and uh, it's going to take a very long while to fix it. So what do we do? Well, as far as we are concerned, we are trying to figure out how to manage our resources, uh, assuming that things are virtually not improving for at least six months and then improving at small trickles thereafter. So in hospitality, I know for certain that re revenues will be almost zero for at least three to four months, and then it will trickle up almost in trickles. Uh, if for some reason the fear goes away, then maybe October to December could see uh, a reasonable uh, sort of comeback. But that's the earliest. And therefore, we have to, of course, cut down costs. And one way, uh, you know, in, in hospitality, 25% of the total turnover is our wage bill, which is quite significant and steep. So we've had to uh, figure out how we can ask everyone to bear the pain and provide during the lockdown period some kind of a sustenance advance. And then subsequently, when they open up, maybe a little lesser amount with some deferral payment to be made once things come back to normal. In real estate, we have also done similarly. Of course, uh, it, the wage bill is not that high. So uh, in terms of staff costs, so part deferral payment, part payment now cutting down heavily on all uh, sort of uh, overheads and other expenses and bringing down the pace of construction to match with the cash flow. Of course, we are assuming that RERA will give some extension of time uh, for completion of projects uh, between six months to 12 months and hopefully now, uh, things we should come back. Well, one good news on real estate is that home has become a very important part of everyone's life. We've been blocked in. So obviously people know that everyone would like to have a good home and perhaps a little more space. So there would be, I think, a, a focus on acquiring properties as soon as people feel a little more secured and they feel that, uh, you know, their income is not... Uh, much destroyed, I think that should come back reasonably well, uh, maybe six, eight, nine months from now. So this is, uh, I think what we all need to do is, uh, as a captain of a ship that has walked into a storm, you need to steer the ship out of the storm. And sometimes you have to lighten the load. So you can't harm the passengers. So you need to offload baggage. Now, who's got more baggage? Obviously, the people in the upper deck, the richer people have more baggage. So baggage in the sense here would be salaries. So we will have to find a graded cut where the senior people, uh, including uh, management team, etc., take a bigger part of that share and then the impact on the lower people who don't have too much baggage and have no ability to throw it all out. Uh, we have to do that. And then with the hope that if this ship is then rescued and comes out of the storm, once it comes back uh, over a period of time, we will compensate. And as the business comes back, we will compensate the sacrifices made by those who made more will be compensated more. 
and for those who make less who be compensated less so this is really how one can look at it equitably uh, it's a very painful thing uh, losing jobs is a very big problem i suppose some of it is inevitable but the attempt would be and at least that's our attempt is to make job loss very very minimal and only if it is essential and really look at sacrifices that everyone makes so that at least during this very difficult storm we are able to support everyone to at least live a life if not a lifestyle thank you thank you bhaiya i think uh, quite thought provoking words i think both of you actually alluded to the fact that there is going to be a reduction in uh, demand for discretionary and you know uh, Uh, Mr. Kanoria, you mentioned about luxury, lifestyle, frugality. Now, the first question that comes to my mind, which I would like both of you to weigh in, is that unfortunately, the economy is a vicious cycle. So, somewhere where the consumption or where the purchases actually starts going down, even be it discretionary or luxury or lifestyle, it somewhere affects an individual who's making those handbags or who's, you know, making those luxury products. and with the unemployment there you know looming large you know there would be a reduction in demand of even basic products so um, the i know the question that everybody would have on the top of their minds is we are looking at all of these figures from around the world where the governments have given x percentage of the gdp uh, stimulus uh, bailout packages salaries and uh, i think it's been over a month now that we have been under lockdown and yet we are still waiting for something concrete to come out to shore up confidence if nothing else that we'll be okay so uh how what would be your view should the government now step in you know uh, at least make certain statements uh shoring up the confidence or is it still too early and we do not know the size of the damage or the magnitude of what needs to be done what would be uh, first if i can ask uh, mr kanoria and then uh, harsh bhaiya on the same see what i would suggest is and that that is what we have been trying to persuade and highlight to the government also flag it off that what is required immediately is liquidity so therefore how can you ensure that there is liquidity with the businesses and with everyone there is money in hand and that can be done by taking some very simple steps so one step is that there is they are the bankers so today there are certain norms that the banks follow that if a person does not pay on a due date then he gets into sma 0 sma 1 sma 2 then then it becomes an npl so at this juncture what is immediately required before the economy totally opens up and the lockdown is removed before that everyone plans their cash flows they ex- they basically work out their future cash flow on the basis of the impact which the covid would be having go back to the bankers or to the lenders and do a one time restructuring with them so that when they open up they are not faced with another problem of liquidity and if they require some more funds depending upon what the lenders see that the business is required they can extend that to the companies so therefore it will ensure liquidity second way that the liquidity can be brought in so the first point which has to be addressed is on liquidity second is that there is a lot of money which is lying with the government and especially in the infra space we see that it, it has a chain effect because then people are not in a position to pay the bills which are pending with the government the arbitration award there are tax refunds which are there there are basically tax disputes which are lying so these are within the control of the government and these can be addressed and with alacrity it can be settled and sorted out so again it will release liquidity in the in the system so at one particular factor and uh, which is going to really help is if people are able to get liquidity post covid second is subsidies so therefore each sector they cannot be in one medicine for all the problems which the people have there is no panacea so therefore for each industry for each sector there would be different kind of support which can be given so it has to be given sector wise if because we are not we are not we are not like the us or japan etc which has huge money available with the government or the government can go in for huge fiscal deficit which us is going uh, around with 
we can't afford to do that and the government does not have the mindset to do it so sector wise wherever the problems are there and if you put in small of amount of money also the government has to act like a catalyst that if these sectors require x amount of money let me provide those subsidies to those particular sectors instead of just making a generalized one because the generalized one will require a huge amount of money and i think that that is where the government if they think about it in a very logical manner it could be in a position to address the problems of the economy to a large extent i'm not saying that it will alleviate all the problems but it will be in a position to to uh, support the companies support the entire economy with lower amount of money and with a lot of acting more as a catalyst and that is where i think that the government should take an approach to if i was to ask you you know the retort back from the rbi is that the liquidity is at the highest point you know so i think there were some press reports and statements being given out that there's almost 6 lakh something crores of liquidity uh, slushing around in the banks and uh, but every single msme corporate that i speak to everybody still says that i do not have liquidity i haven't bought anything so where is the discrepancy where is the dichotomy because every businessman is saying that i don't have liquidity i need liquidity support but the banks are saying we are flush with liquidity so where is the real issue that is coming up so there basically you see being a lender i can tell you that there is a scare in the minds of the lender because we are now operating through very stringent guidelines so let us suppose that if a person if a company has a problem there is no room for us to support the company by giving them liquidity or by even allowing them to defer the installments by one or two quarters and that may be the need of the hour so therefore the solution are solutions are very simple to remove the fear excuse me no like the us has done which is into forgivable loans uh, government backed loans is that the solution no no i'm not talking about the government backed loans again i said that you know the government does not have too much of money so therefore the government we should not expect the government is going to infuse a lot of money the government only has to act as a catalyst there is liquidity as you very rightly said that there is almost about 6 to 7 lakhs crore of liquidity which is lying in the bank and in the system so how it can be channelized now there is a scare for the lenders because they have to follow certain stringent guidelines which today is not appropriate so let us suppose if someone needs food and at this particular juncture health and food is important but if let us suppose the government comes out with a guideline and says that if you do not adhere to these parameters you will be given no medicine if you do not adhere to these parameters then you will not be given any food it doesn't happen because when there is a crisis then you have to get those particular parameters loosened up so similarly today the first thing which has to be done is this parameter for the npl provision has to be loosened up as soon as it happens the banks and the lenders will be more forthcoming in working along with the borrowers for a solution today there is no room to do that so hashbi if i have to come to you now about consumption and demand uh, uh, india has traditionally been a consumption led economy you know we have not been uh, unlike some other countries like china which has been primarily based out of exports uh the fears that you said is absolutely relevant and true like today there will be a fear of losing your job there will be a fear of unemployment there will be a fear of your salary going down and you would want to conserve cash you would want to save a lot more uh how do you actually give a uh, impetus and confidence to people that uh, you know you can go back and spend because if we do not have the same spending capacity if we do not increase our spending in the coming years you know we our gdp is not going to rise our growth is not going to happen and 5 trillion dollar is going to be a, a a dream which will never be seen so what do you think can be done to actually increase that confidence in people to increase the spending going forward see the primary cause of this fear uh, sorry the primary cause of this reticence to spend is fear and the fear is emanating actually from the pandemic the consequence of that is the job loss and the rest of it so the key thing is to get the fear out of you now how do you get the fear out of you so one is that the government comes and says that this is a flu it is not as serious as it sounded earlier we've got a hang of it we've got some kind of control over it that's one way now i don't know whether that's the wise thing to do because i'm not a medical person 
The other, of course, is to have as quickly as possible a medicine for it. And the third, of course, is to have a vaccine for it. Now, other than this, I can't find any reason why the fear will go. The economy is absolutely interlinked to this fear. Until the fear will go, you do what you want with the economy. It's not going to really make too much of a difference because people will have an uncertainty in their mind about so many things that they will not actually go in for consumption, simply. I mean, why would anyone want to go and buy a house now when they don't know whether you know things will settle out in six months, three months, or 12 months? Why would anyone want to go out and do shopping or go to a restaurant or even socializing when you know that you are liable to be infected? So all this, I mean, and you know, the, the people who will take more risk, that is, really the daily wage earner who will say, listen, I will really perish if I sit at home. I might as well go out and take the risk. His business, as you rightly said, will only work provided the other guy who has the money actually goes out to buy his services. I mean, simply, I think uh, I, I need a haircut badly, but sheer the fact that I don't know whether I should be getting to the barber uh, is stopping me from getting a haircut. Now, it's what will that barber do even if he gets to his saloon? He can't get uh, uh, money until someone comes there as a client. The client is going to be reticent. So this is a chain. And I think, therefore, it, it all boils down to only one thing, which is getting the fear out. That is the key. The second thing which is important is once the fear is out also, the problem is not solved. Because by then, the liquidity has dried up. He has lost a part of his salary, businesses have got broken. So the next thing which has to happen simultaneously with the removal of fear is the infusion of liquidity in the system like Hemant alluded to and government policy. This is the critical dhaka to the Gadi which has got stuck in the ditch. If you don't give the dhaka, you can keep revving the machine, you'll only get exhausted and nothing will happen. So this dhaka is critical and I have no measure of doubt that the government understands it. I just hope that they come out with this announcement earlier than later because the assurance that you are standing by to give the dhaka, maybe today, maybe when the lockdown opens, maybe whenever it is appropriate, but at least you know that the guy is standing there, if policy measures are in place, jab darkar hoga, to dhaka mil jayega and my car will be on the road. I think that will be a huge reassurance to business. Yeah, I think even like knowing that the tow truck is on its way to take the car out of the ditch, just a simple statement that, you know, the yeah. tow truck is on the way will go a long way at this moment. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, all of us need haircuts and now we all become <laughs> super chefs and barbers at home. So mm. I, uh, you can try your own hat at maybe doing that. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to take some questions from the audience. Uh, the first question from Tuhin Puddar, if I can ask you, Harsh Bhaiya. Uh, he asks, uh, post-COVID-19, where, which industry do you think new opportunities will be created and how? You know, we are too preoccupied trying to figure out how to get out of this crisis for me to really give you a very <laughs> smart and intelligent answer. But clearly one knows that technology will be important. I think we have a very, very uh, large opportunity in the healthcare sector, not because of the fact that another pandemic may be around the corner, but just because we have realized as a country that our healthcare system needs significant uh, upgradation and perhaps there will be policy measures that will uh, make for faster implementation of a more robust healthcare system. So uh, that could be certainly one area. Uh, of course, medicines and pharmaceuticals is certainly another area and there could be many others, but frankly speaking, I'm not even focusing on that. I've now given a thought to it. I'm busy trying to see that I can steer my ship out of this storm. And then once we are on the dock, we'll figure out if there are other opportunities. Uh, so if I can ask uh, you, Heyman Bhaiya, the same thing. is: Do you see any green shoots, any opportunity areas where post-COVID uh, some industries are just going to zoom? I think that uh, I agree with you, Harsh that uh, technology would be one of the areas where people will definitely have huge amount of opportunities because of what we have seen during the lockdown period and for the whole world <clears throat> that everyone has started using technology extensively. So 
technology was being used as a part of communication but technology will be will become the biggest business and there are a lot of opportunities within the technology sector sub sectors will develop within technology itself so i think that that is one area definitely there will be a huge opportunity secondly which i think is that there would be an opportunity would be for residential real estate sector because people will want to look if you look at the asset classes they people will may want to invest at present people will be wary of stocks people will of the stock market people will also be wary of any other investments so real estate which traditionally used to be an investment may again come back so therefore i do not see that real estate values will be very high there will be a moderation in the prices but it will become an asset class and they would be investments which will start coming in for people who want to hold it as an asset class so therefore the real estate also should pick up as the things normalize to a certain extent sec the third area which i think is about food essentials all the essential products will definitely be in demand infrastructure there is no other option there has to be demand for infrastructure because any kind of movement power etc but there will be a resetting so all the businesses which today has a high value will be taken over by people because those companies will get into stress so there will be opportunities for people to acquire those assets which are at stress so there will be a huge assets which will be up for sale which will be stressed assets the fifth area where if the government puts in their act in place could be a huge import substitution because they are importing for almost about 60 billion dollars worth of goods from china every year so this could be an opportunity if it can be properly structured proper industrial parks can be created where it would be plug and play there are a lot of smes etc there could be import substitution and government can give them the support so it will again create jobs it will create industries but it requires some support without government support and without a strategic view of the government and strategic support from the government this will not happen but this is this i think is a huge opportunity because 60 billion dollars is what we are importing from china and i think that the government should immediately focus at to what extent 30% 40% can it be replaced in india because then it will create huge employment and uh, huge investment opportunity so these are some of the sectors which i think that they would be an opportunity so uh, you know it's a very important point that you talk about exports and uh, for benefit of all of you i can say that the government is very serious about increasing our exports in manufacturing and they have selected 12 sub sectors and sectors where they're targeting a 100 billion dollar export by 2025 and there are regular conversations happening on what the government needs to do out of the box out of the ordinary to ensure that these sectors where either import substitution or shifting of base from china india can capitalize so there's a question that mayu kre and roshni datta are asking uh, which first i would want to go to you harsh bhaiya is about emotions uh, we all know that the entrepreneurial spirit is based on passion emotions risk taking ability and a lot of people from across across spectrum of entrepreneurs are losing that passion or losing that emotion and to be very frank some of them are just getting lazy and enjoying their home and wondering uh, whether we really need to invest or work harder and take the risk that we usually take when we can enjoy our lives how do you think this evolving over the are we going to be back in the rat race are we going to be back on the treadmill or is it something that will change our mental setup permanently well um uh... you know if this crisis uh, doesn't change us at least somewhat i think it will be a very big tragedy because after such a big shock there must be a reset of our thinking and i think it's uh, only the right thing to happen i hope it does because we tend to boomerang back to the same life once things settle down but um, i do believe that people will certainly be more conscious of sustainability they will be more conscious of environment i think they will be more conscious of as hemant mentioned in his address the little joys of life uh, far more than perhaps they were before uh, i do believe also that the sense of family emotional bonding etc will have got reignited uh, of course uh, 
on a lighter note, it could have also become worse because you spend part of time at home. But uh, uh, I, I hope certainly that it would have got reignited in a positive way. So I think they should be, and hopefully it will last for some years before the old habits will come back uh, regrettably. But uh, it will, I think, make those changes. But it's important that how we address this challenge now, uh, particularly in our families and in our organization, uh, we have an opportunity to display our character, to see how we take the problem in an equitable way rather than a selfish way. It is very, very tempting at this time to become selfish and looking at your self-interest as predominant over the larger good of the larger many because everyone is scared and everyone has the big challenge in front of them uh, about having lost a lot of wealth, uh, so to say. So uh, really, how do we build on our inner reserves of equity and dharma, uh, I think will come into play. And uh, I think that will really distinguish ourselves from a self-actualization point of view, which I think ultimately in the long run should also work very well from a enterprise point of view. Maybe in the short run, it may be an expensive call. But, um, but anyway, there is no right answer to this. I think everyone to his own. Uh, certainly, uh, this is not something to be preached. It's something that intuitively people will practice as per their own assessment of the situation, and which is the right thing to do. Yeah, so I was, uh, I was telling someone uh, yesterday is that this, this kind of uh, event in our lives are going to separate the men from the boys. It's, it's actually going to take every little ounce of courage that we have had to be pushing forward and to ensure that we can go back to where we were. Uh, so if I can come to you, Hemant Bhai, a question from Dr. Rajiv Singh is, can you share some specific suggestions for MSMEs in terms of the measures that they should take in their businesses with regards to the pandemic that has been going on? I think that first of all, the most important uh, assessment, which each of the business will have to do is from the demand assessment. That what do they expect that after COVID-19 lockdown is over, <clears throat> what would the demand of their products will be? And to what extent they will be, and because they are all either a part of a supply chain or they would be dependent upon the supply chain. So what would get negatively affected? And to that extent, moderate the entire business model. So revisiting the business model will be the most important aspect. And second is to see that, you know, if someone is in either manufacturing some products or in services, where they can reduce their costs. So that would be the second aspect to look at. The third is that, you know, if the government comes out with certain stops, certain kind of support, very good. If they do not come, come out with it, then how do you sustain the business? It may be a time to also to rethink that some of the MSMEs may think that they will get into extinct, extinction or they will have problems. So it is better to take a call of shutting down and getting into something else because there is no use trying to pursue a particular business because in the changed environment, it may not be relevant or it may not be profitable because the business dharma is to make profit. And if the business is not making profit in a proper manner, they should make profit. And if they are not making profit, then it's better to shut down. And that also is a decision. Many times to shut down and close down the business and to exit is also a good decision. Because it is not that what will you do after that? After that, you will be in a position to find out something else to do. But revisiting the business models and making a very clear cut dem demand supply assessment, consumer demand assessment will be extremely critical for all the SM MSMEs. No, I'm not only talking about the S MSMEs, but it is also for the large companies. They also have to ask the same question. Even the infrastructure companies like we are also going through the brainstorming and the churning process in all the businesses that we are in, that are we relevant? Will we be relevant after the COVID-19? If we are not going to be relevant, how do we, in a structured manner, close it down? Because that may be appropriate for closing down that business. Because otherwise, you are just running on a treadmill and you are not moving anywhere. So I think that this is also this 
introspection of six weeks time or if it gets extended further is good because it has made us to rethink that whether we are running on a treadmill or are we traversing some distances or not because if you are not traversing a distance then it is not worth the while so i think that these are the questions which each of the businesses will have to ask there is no panacea there is no just one medicine for everyone so everyone has to go through their own process i think it's uh, really soul searching times and times for hard calls and uh, it really uh, has is going to dig out every ounce of energy and courage that we have to cross this so now if uh, last couple of questions i know that it's almost time over uh, so if i was to ask harsh bhai a question for mr ravi todi is uh, how will covid how is covid going to affect women at work will it be more affected in this economic situation or will there be more opportunities for them going forward well simple reading of the situation says there will be more opportunities simply because we have now learned how to work effectively from home and a lot of women uh, were unable to come and join the workplace simply because the daily uh, trek to work with small child at home was a big problem but they had the time they had the talent if they could work from home i think a lot of them would be happy to work and a lot of companies would be happy to hire that talent because uh, they were talented and uh, if they can find a way to work uh, they can work from home i think that could be to my mind uh, certainly an increase in opportunity i completely agree with that i think this period has shown that people can be effective even working from home and uh, this actually might open up a lot more opportunities in terms of gender equality of our economy uh, i think we have run out of time so if i could just request both of you uh, to give your closing remarks and then uh, you know a message for all our listeners on the webinar then we could just end this event with that bhaiya first you yeah so i think that uh, basically what i would like to convey to everyone that you know this is uh, this is interesting time it is also intriguing both interesting and intriguing because this has never happened in the history of mankind that we have been exposed to this kind of a lockdown where the whole world has shut down and gradually opening up so it has been a good time for everyone to introspect develop themselves personally on the personal front and also if they are engaged in any career profession study is the time where we have got the time to pause think but we should thank also because gratitude should come out from for uh, from us into everything even that covid has not affected us and many most of us have not been afflicted with covid that also is something that we should thank covid that they have not uh, that it has not affected us so i think that gratitude is something which should come out of us and it should make us into better human beings going forward seeing positive is very important because i think that you know every uh, dark cloud has a silver lining and similarly here also i'm sure that the economy the world will be a better place to live in after this thank you well uh... i resonate with every word that hemant has said so really nothing much more to add except to say that you know um, in the face of the difficulties that all of us face it is natural to feel worried to feel concerned because we can see a large part of the enterprise that we have built getting much impacted adversely maybe even partly destroyed so this is a time to be able to be in in a state of equipoise not to be in, in a state of agitation and to be mentally reconciled to the fact that there will be a huge erosion of value that would have happened it has already happened and that we have to actually start rebuilding uh instead of focusing too much on the erosion i think we should focus on rebuilding that's number 1 and number 2 we must be conscious that people who made help us to build the enterprise to that level we should not completely let them down in these difficult times maybe we should uh find a way to see that at least as many as possible we take along maybe in uh in a lesser sense in the sense of lesser remuneration but we take them along because this is a time when people will find it very difficult 
to find other options. So this is really what I have to say. I'm saying this knowing fully well that every business of mine can't afford the teams that we have, but uh, that is our endeavor. I'm sure we can't save every job, but we're trying our best to see that we can be uh, able to. Through COVID, we have uh, managed to do these webinars. We have managed to get hundreds of people together on a virtual platform, which would be unthinkable a month batch. And this is a time when all of us have to, again, look back at our initial days, how we fought adversities and how we overcame them and how we actually uh, conquered success again in our lives. With that, I would thank all of you for joining us. I know there's a lot of questions we could not uh, um, answer because of paucity of time, but hopefully in the next webinar, we can take those up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Ash. Thank you. Thank you.